I've been warning in books like this, which you will receive yourself very soon, of the risks of new pandemics uh, for the last 20 years. And the reason for that is that my own cancer practice as a hospice doctor was hijacked in 1988 by, by a new mutant virus, which came from nowhere, completely disrupted my own medical practice in London, overwhelmed it. That mutant virus had jumped from animals into humans at some time, we don't know when. It has since killed 45 million people. And despite a search for vaccines for 32 years, we're still 15 years from a virus vaccine for that. So that is why, as you can imagine, I've been sensitized to this problem. I want to share with you some thoughts about the truth, about what's actually going on, which I suggest to you, as, uh, as you'll see, is rather different from the media hype. So here we go. Um, and I'm particularly interested in your perspectives um, and how they impact pharma. So first thing I'd say is this, the greatest risk for any leader, any pharma company, in fact, is two words. It's institutional blindness. It's when we've been in one particular sector, one particular division, one particular team for too long, and we kind of lose that wider picture. And that certainly happened with coronavirus. It's also happened in pharma innovation. The normal pace of pharma innovation is far too slow to be able to help with things like COVID. And in fact, if we look at the top 10, top 15 pharma companies globally, last year they spent $100 billion, but uh, discovered only 20% of new drugs. So the, most of the budget, but hardly any of the innovation. How is that? And what does that mean for COVID? Well, COVID came and blindsided us, those of us who hadn't actually considered the risks of these things over the last few years. And we've seen pharma innovation completely reinvent itself over the last eight months. And we will see more innovation in pharma over the next two years than in the previous six as a direct result of COVID for reasons I'll explain. Now, new viruses are emerging every 12 months somewhere in the world. That is why I've been warning about this for so long. Let's just take a look at a few over the last 20 years. 2003, we saw two, one, two new viruses. SARS killed 10%, bird flu 60%. By the way, SARS killed equally children under the age of two as people over the age of 80. Now that's really scary. And we've had such a near miss with coronavirus COVID-19, which is killing almost entirely those over the age of 80, unless they're already quite sick from other things. But in 2009, here's another example. We had swine flu. It spread to 50% of the world's children in 12 months killing fortunately only 0.02% of the population. In 2012, we saw MERS with a one in three mortality rate. And in 2019, we've been very lucky that this particular one is only 1% mortality or thereabouts. But the big question is this, doubling time. And here, there are some big surprises to us. In most nations in March, you will remember that numbers were doubling around every four and a half days. What that means is that in 45 days, you go from one case in, that's 10 doublings. In one case, you go, you go from one case to a thousand. Or if you have a thousand cases in a country already, you go from a thousand to a million. And if you have a million cases in a country, you go from a million to a billion. Yes, that's right. A million to a billion in 10 doublings, a million to a billion in only 45 days. That is the speed at which coronavirus is spreading. Actually, it was worse. In the UK, it was spreading in London at, at a doubling rate of every two days. That's two days, 20 days, from one case to a thousand, one case from a thousand to a million in 40 days, and then what do you do? Now, what's interesting is what's been going on, because if you look globally, I, I don't care, yeah, I, I do a lot of work, humanitarian work with the AIDS Foundation that my wife and I started 32 years ago when that virus HIV hijacked my medical practice. But when, uh, when you look at what's happening now, there's something quite dramatic. Uh, it, you may only be detecting, let's say, 10% of all new infections with COVID-19 in Kinshasa hospitals. I don't care. It doesn't matter whether it's 10% or 60% for the purposes of this graph. But by whatever measure, the numbers are not increasing exponentially. In fact, new infections and deaths have been relatively constant since June globally. And what is more, if you look at Asia, Africa and Asia, even when you look at uh, a hospital that has been regularly seeing people with strange pneumonias, um, and whenever they test, they find 60% of all strange pneumonias are COVID. So they say, okay, that's our measure. But if you look at what's happening in those hospitals, you've seen the deaths from COVID fall off a cliff 
in many hospitals in Africa and in Asia. So what on earth is going on? Please don't tell me that it's saturated. We have only seen 45, 46, maybe 100, 200 million cases undetected maybe globally out of 7.7 billion human beings. So we are at the very earliest stages of spread, but still things are flattening. What's going on? In the UK, of course, we weren't really testing in the early stages very much. And we've seen a, a recent spread and big spikes, but deaths have remained relatively low. And this is an absolute statistic using similar measures to the ones we were using on the, on the, on the 10th of April, where you see that peak. So what's going on? Now, we know that 80% of people have no symptoms. We know that around a third of people who are sick with COVID in hospitals are testing negative for viral protein, which is a really scary thing. I can tell you if you're running a hemodialysis unit in London Hospital, as, as, a, as a friend of mine is. But 17% of Londoners already have COVID antibodies. What is interesting is that when you do a much more difficult test, you see there are three tests, as you know. One is for the viral proteins, where you can't even find them when someone's got antibodies because the antibodies wipe them out. So that's a very early test. And then you can test for antibodies, but that's a temporary test. Many people develop antibodies and then the antibodies collapse. And then there's a third test, which is T-cell reactivity to COVID-19 virus, but that is very difficult to do. Now, um, what it means is this, if you look at say 17% of Londoners who already have antibodies, if you look closely, you'll find that over half of London has already been exposed their T cells are reacting beautifully to COVID. So what's going on? Here's something else. I uh, started reporting, picking up reports and, uh, and, and, uh, and commenting on them back in May. Interesting studies of people who've had common colds in the past in laboratory situations, and we've kept their serum against common cold research, and we've then tested their serum against COVID-19 virus. And what we found is in many people a really vigorous antibody response and T cell response to coronavirus, COVID-19, from people who've never seen it before, who simply had common colds. Now, I, I, that didn't particularly surprise me because, of course, coronavirus is just like another kind of coronaviruses. There are several of them and they cause common colds. The worrying thing about these things is common colds do not produce permanent immunity. They usually stimulate an immune response, stimulate T cells and antibodies, the immunity fades away and you get exactly the same common cold a few weeks or months later. But what's interesting about this is what it tells us about immunity generally. And I predicted that, uh, well, I thought it quite likely, uh, if this was true, that we would start to see reports that households that had young children in them, one, two or three or four year olds, might be more are likely to be immune or protected from COVID-19 than households with none. Now you might say, well, that's just age group or stage of life. No, when you correct for age and stage of life and for other medical factors, we can now see in new research that has yet to be confirmed, but early research suggests that deaths from COVID-19 are lower if you have young children at home. Now, why should that be? Well, if it's true, if there is an element of cross-reactivity in some people to some degree, if you've been swamped with coughs and colds and snotty, snotty noses and things like that from young children, that there could be some effect here. Now, the reason why this matters is that my friends who work in, say, the slums of Kinshasa or the slums of, uh, of let's say, um, Kolkata are reporting to me that they, are, they, they think that they are seeing smaller death rates amongst the very poorest of the poor. Not what you'd expect. But it might be what you expect if ex massive exposure in very dense populations to lots and lots of coronaviruses and things like that might just give some people the added edge. Now, the other possibility is that the virus itself is changing. We would expect that. Indeed, just about every pandemic has mutated over time, usually becoming, fortunately, less lethal, less dangerous. Why is that? I told you about MERS, which kills one in three of people, or, or SARS, uh, one in 10. Viruses that cause catastrophic death in so many people are usually easy to track and, and they wipe themselves out. In fact, many people die before they have the opportunity to spread it. The most dangerous viruses, funnily enough, are ones which produce very big delay between infection and symptoms like HIV, which causes AIDS maybe 10 or 15 years later. 
or viruses that cause in most people no problem at all, but they become very infectious transmitters. So let's have a look at the virus mutation theory. Well, here we have a slight worry, more than a slight worry. You will have heard of 17 million mink who are being culled right now in Denmark. Why is that? Because 200 humans have become infected with a new variant of COVID-19 as a result of that virus passing into mink population. Now that's very worrying, particularly as we've seen already that COVID infects lions, tigers, cats, dogs, bats, ferrets, Syrian hamsters. In fact, it's quite easy to get COVID if you're an animal. More difficult for an animal to transmit it into humans, fortunately, but as you've seen with the mink, it can happen. And the big problem is this, when you pass a virus through a new species, it's put out a fantastic evolutionary pressure and that is how you get rapid mutation. So that is the reason why uh, there's been huge pressure internationally on the Danish government to act decisively and to destroy all of these mink, but we've already got infected mink in other nations, it seems. Now, uh, so what does this mean? Well, it's very important because if we do develop a vaccine and we have vaccines, we have 53 vaccines, several already uh, being tried out in, 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 on a large scale in China and Russia, others about to hit the UK, the US and so on. We have 83 clinical trials, but the $50 million question is, so what? If you stimulate antibodies and white cells, how long will it last? I mean, if you have a vaccine you have to take every four months, not so good. Even worse, if you have a vaccine that if you've had it before and you take it again four months later, there's a bigger risk of a bigger, bigger side effect than problems too. Now, I have a member of my own family is sick with COVID right now. She's a nurse on the front line. It's her second time. She caught COVID badly in, in March, April. She had nice high antibodies. Her antibodies fell off a cliff in July and August. Her T cell response is not enough to prevent it. And now she's sick again. Now, it could be that we're going to find millions of people like uh, my own niece uh, in the future. We just don't know. All of them vaccinated may, and, and many of them becoming sick about four or five months or six months later. So let's be very cautious about deciding that the vaccine is the be all and end all of coronavirus research. Now, if we don't know how long immunity lasts with the vaccine, and by the way, how long, we, how, how long do we have to wait? We have no idea. It could take us at least two years to know whether the vaccine will last two years in terms of protection. You can see we are at the very earliest stages. It will take 10 years or more for us to be clear how COVID vaccine works in the longer term. Now, this is really bad news because I've told you already that we see new viruses every 12 months. Every now and then we see global pandemics, HIV, um, uh, uh, a, a, a swine fever, a, a, a coronavirus, the COVID-19 and so on. So quite clearly we have to look in another direction. And this is the scandal. You know, it's an absolute scandal to me that, you know, that almost nothing has changed in antiviral research since I trained as a doctor over 30 years ago. In fact, almost nothing has changed since the day that penicillin was discovered. Uh, why do I say that? When penicillin was discovered, it became a revolutionary cure for all kinds of bacterial infections. If you had a bacterial pneumonia, penicillin done. And we've since developed all kinds of new antibiotics. If you have a child who's dying of a bacterial meningitis, we will cure them, bang, hopefully. But if that child has a viral meningitis, you tell me a single drug we have in the medicine cabinet that I can give your child, zero. Almost zero, yes, we can damp things down with dexamethasone or do other things like that, but we're simply fiddling around the edges, hoping that your child's own immune system will throw the virus out. Let's take AIDS. Yes, of course, you'll tell me, dramatic advances in antiviral technology for HIV and AIDS, and it's now become a chronic illness. Yes, 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 but if you have a child dying of bacterial pneumonia tonight, desperately ill in intensive care, and the doctors come, a viral pneumonia, and the doctors come to you and say, we've got good news. Say, what's that? We can give this person, your, your child, an antiviral, and they can go home on Sunday. See, hallelujah, thank you. The bad news is, they say, the child, your child will have to take an antiviral medication for the rest of their lives until they're 90 or 95 years old. You say, come again? Yes, because we can't get rid of the virus, you see, we just sort of dampen it down. Welcome to the world of AIDS. That is precisely what's happening for around 10 million people, 10 
10 million people around the world right now who have to take antivirals every day of their lives to stay well. I don't call that a good solution. That's not as good a solution as penicillin was in the 1940s. So you can expect as pharma companies to see a gigantic pressure to produce next generation solutions, real antivirals, drugs that will be as effective as penicillin or, uh, or, um, uh, or a whole host of other antibiotics to block surface cell receptors, to prevent the virus from getting into a cell, block the gene translation, block the virus from being manufactured, block its release and block immune overreactions. We will see those, we have to. Humanity cannot be held to ransom any longer uh, by these kinds of things. We cannot have lockdown for a year every time a new mutant emerges and wait for a vaccine. We have to find a different solution. Now, in all of this, as I said, R&D has been revolutionized, turned completely upside down and we've gone viral. So clinical trials that took five years to set up and run have taken five months. We're recruiting, treating, mon tra treating monitoring and tracking online. It's, we won't go back, we've learned a lot and it's very exciting. And in it all, we will expect a shift from normal traditional R&D targeting of you know, cardiovascular systems or immunosystems or respiratory systems with astonishing breakthroughs, fusing together all the lessons we've learned from COVID, accelerated by virtual medicine and the rest.